less people back from lunch, a better chance of you getting a potato. Where'd the potatoes go? Here they are. Don't worry, I haven't lost the potatoes. What's that? Oh, no. Although some people on Twitter have called my kids the tater tots. Uh, and I think it was last year, they got me a card that was like, it was a dad potato for my birthday or something. It was a dad potato with little kid tater tots. It was pretty, pretty great. Yeah, they're, they're pretty good. So, all right, so who wants a potato? You want a potato, you want a potato, you want a, wow, everybody wants a potato. Uh, okay. It's actually pretty evenly spread between everybody, but these two sections have gotten all the potato throws. But you guys, the problem is you guys are all spread out. That's what I'm worried about. What's that? What, just like toss it up there and just let them all have at it? That's a pretty good idea, actually. Uh, okay, well, Idaho guys are filling in the, the blank there. Um, although you live near me, so you could just get a potato. When, you could literally just go out to any piece of dirt in Idaho and pick up a potato, right? Sugar beet. No, no sugar beets. Adam, come on. With the sugar beet thing again. Yeah, I, okay. Like, are sugar beets a yes or a boo? Like, which boo? <laughs> sugar beets potato. Adam, maybe you should come up here and tell the potato jokes. All right, well, you guys are going to get a potato over here. Somebody is, so I'm just going to chuck it that way, and whoever gets it, uh, yeah, I'm going to go for the back corner. Yeah, sure. All right, here we go. Uh, I'm going to move a little closer, see what I can do here. Oh, oh and, and the winner is, oh, nice. Okay. Sorry, Norwood. Next time, buddy. Uh, one other thing, too, since we only have 10 potatoes and, like, 200 of you, if you want these are not plushy potatoes, but they are potato stickers. So if you want a potato sticker, I got potato stickers all day. So, okay. Yeah, well, I'm not going to throw them right now because they, they wouldn't go very far. Just come find me. You'll, you'll get one. Don't worry. So, cool. Well, with that, I would like to introduce our next speaker. She is a former social studies teacher, now turned Wi-Fi engineer. She's got the heart of a teacher, and I think she's very likely to be one of our very next CWNEs. So let's introduce Jesse Shipman. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I have an announcement. Uh, Jesse, is, what number are you? Uh, 331. 331. Congratulations. Yeah. Four weeks old. Uh, I'm yeah. just the MC. Nobody tells me anything. <laughs> uh, that's okay. Um, it wasn't on my profile because they made me submit it before I was a CWNE. So it's only like four weeks old. So uh, don't feel too bad, Joel. Um, I just want to start by just saying, like, thank you so much, the CWNP. Thank you, Lex, Ash, she's around here, um, Tom, and the whole team. Uh, this community is tremendous, and it is a great honor to be a part of it, um, and even more so to be up here speaking to some of the most brilliant minds I've ever met, um, my Wi-Fi heroes. Uh, many of you are in this room, and you know who you are, and so um, it's, it's crazy to be up here speaking to you about this. Um, I'm going to talk about full duplex Wi-Fi, and, and I've put on here FutureFi. Um, this was dubbed by the great Rick Murphy. Um, so if you go to uh, wirelesstrainingsolutions.com, I think it's slash blog, or just hit the blog button, uh, you'll find a whole series of blogs on FutureFi. He sort of touched on, on full duplex Wi-Fi, um, but this is where I, I kind of got that term. I felt like I needed to give a shout out to him for that. You can follow me on Twitter at shipman underscore jesse. Um, we've all been here. <laughs> Right? Probably a, a handful of us were here on the way to Nashville. Um, maybe not quite as overt as this, um, but we all know that noise uh, is annoying. <laughs> it's super irritating because of headaches and anxiety. Um, and we solve that problem commercially with, with active noise canceling headphones, right? Um, you put them on, uh, they uh, emit a uh, a sound that is exactly 90 degrees out of phase with most sounds, uh, in, especially in an airplane, reduces noise, reduces anxiety. It's a problem that we've solved. We also deal with noise all the time in Wi-Fi, right? It's one of the things that we think about the most. 
different kinds of noise, right, that we have solved for. So destructive multipath. We, hit, we developed MIMO, right? So instead of it being destructive, now it's constructive. Adjacent channel interference, if we're using 2.4 and we want to use channels 2, 3, 4, and 5, we can't because we get adjacent channel interference. We can only use three channels in 2.4. So we open up five, 5 gigahertz, and then hopefully soon, 6 gigahertz, we get lots more channels and no adjacent channel interference. And then co-channel interference, right? Setting up multiple APs with the same uh, channel causes lots of noise and interference. And we solve for that with education, right? Um, we tell and hopefully are telling people all the time that that's a bad idea and to be thinking about it. But none of those problems really solve for the biggest bottleneck in, in Wi-Fi, which is the idea that it's a contention medium that you can only really have uh, one uh, tick stop at a time. Uh, so we, we think we may have attempted to solve for this, right, with Wi-Fi, I said Wi-Fi 6, 802.11 uh, 802.11 AX, um, but ultimately what it comes down to is that Wi-Fi is a half duplex medium. You can only send or receive, not send and receive. Full duplex technologies do both at the same time. So you can have upstream data and downstream data coming at the exact same time. These technologies have existed for quite a while. Um, in old pre-electronic telephones, you separated the microphone from the earpiece and then used a twisted pair of wire in order to get um, up and down without interference. In the 70s, uh, anybody who's in the military probably recognizes this. Uh, it's a ground sat uh, by Plessy Avionics. And uh, this was a full duplex technology, uh, wireless technology that uh, operated in a 30 to 76 megahertz VHF band. Uh, it was incredibly, incredibly expensive and terrible, not terribly practical and very, very heavy. Um, so this is not something we would obviously use in full duplex Wi-Fi or wireless today. Recent full duplex um, technologies, uh, DOCSIS 3.1 and 4.0, Operating in cable systems allow up to 10 gigabits bi uh, bi-directionally, so at the same time. Uh, and that's uh, using both time division duplexing and frequency du division duplexing at the exact same time. Over a bounded medium, obviously. And then we know this one, uh, fiber optic. Uh, it's using wavelength, wavelength division multiplexing, so sending light waves over an optical cable at a different wavelength uh, up and down at the same time to get very high speeds, but both of these are bounded mediums. So why can't Wi-Fi be duplex? It's not a bounded medium. Um, and it causes noise, lots and lots of noise. And not necessarily noise to other receivers, but noise to itself. And this is called echo. So because Wi-Fi is an unbounded medium, the signal actually has to go uh, in a multitude of directions in order to get it to the receivers that it needs, and that allows, or that causes um, a lot of transmission noise. So a transmitted signal can actually be one million to one billion times louder than the received signal that it needs to get at the same time in order, order to do full duplex Wi-Fi. So the key to full duplex Wi-Fi is canceling echo Um, and this needs to happen in a multitude of domains. So that's radio frequency, and then an analog cancellation combined with a digital cancellation, and then actually physically changing the radio, uh, the radio waves, the physical change of radio waves in order to uh, cancel, cancel them out on the receiver side. And each one of those actually has to be coordinated together at the exact moment so that they can be synchronized and subtracted uh, perfectly as a perfect replica. Uh, at, at first, uh, the, the first attempts to do this uh, were done in a time domain cancellation. So Rice University in 2006 uh, created what is known as WARP, or the Wireless Open Access Research Platform. And uh, in 2010, they started using WARP to discover how to do full duplex Wi-Fi. And they recognized that self-interference cancellation or echo cancellation uh, would require antenna separation and then an analog and digital cancellation. 
And that ended up being a, a physical separation. So what they found is that if you do 20 centimeters of separation between a transmit and receive antenna, that there's enough space there to be able to take the transmitted signal, send it over to the receiver, and be able to cancel that out with a digital cancellation. It ended up looking something like this. Um, so this is a desktop with two nodes. And you'll notice here that um, the antennas are separated um, by a, a pretty significant amount. Eventually, it moved on to something like this uh, in 2011. Still, obviously, fairly large. It's sitting on top of a, a large MacBook here. Um, and in, in 2011, Stanford University also used WARP to come up with uh, a, a physical converter of the transmitted signal. So before it ever hits the transmitted antenna, uh, and they called this a, a ballon, or a, a balance to unbalanced converter. And it really catches the transmission before it, it actually goes out into the antenna, and then sends it uh, through a, a filter for attenuation and delay, and sends it on to the receiving, the, the receiving wireless receiver, uh, so that then there can be a, a digital cancellation. And it looks something like this, right? So you're noticing probably that the, the common thread here is that they're enormous. Um, they needed that, that time domain cancellation needed um, physical separation of the transmitting and receiving antenna. But the point here is that it's possible. So they were actually achieving pretty significant bandwidth increases um, but, and doing truly full duplex Wi-Fi. So they were canceling out the transmitted um, signal and able to actually get a received signal. But there's a size problem, right? So in actual WLAN deployments, Nobody's going to carry around a desktop full duplex receiver. It's just not going to happen. We need um, these technologies to fit onto very small platforms like smartphones and access points. And uh, two researchers, uh, Krishnaswamy and Zeusman at Columbia University actually created a few methods to solve for this problem. And one of them was the frequency domain equalization. So it actually uses filters um, to chunk up a, an entire band of frequency into very small pieces. And then each of the, the chunks of that are then um, conditioned and sent over to the receiving side to do a digital cancellation and then um, it's able to cancel out the, the transmitted signal. And they use these filters um, on a CMOS chip. So this is an actual picture of it. And they're using um, transistors as end path filters on, on this tiny chip in order to pick up small chunks of frequency in an entire band. And it kind of works like a graphic equalizer on a stereo system. So um, it's saying, OK, here's some frequency I'm only going to allow through this little bit and then this little bit, and I'm going to put them all together to get the perfect replica of the transmitted, uh, the transmitted signal. And then I'm going to send that over to be able to condition, be conditioned uh, by a digital cancelization. And that's algorithms, math stuff um, that I don't do well. Um, and then it goes into the receiver and is able to be canceled out, and then you only hear the proper receive signal. So in addition to the end path filters, which is the analog cancelization, cancellation, and then the digital cancellation that's happening at the receiver side, we also needed to think about how antennas could physically see the receive or the the transmitted signal differently. Um, so, Christian Oswami and Dink at Columbia were able to actually demonstrate a pair of compact antennas uh, that orthogonally polar polarized the transmitted signal from the uh, received signal. So they were opposite and separate, and they were able to um, get kind of a a very perfectly conditioned, very highly tuned um, cancellation. Um, at the receiver port. Um, obviously, there are some continuing challenges, otherwise we'd probably see this 
um, already going on in commercial use. Uh, it's definitely not. So some of the continuing challenges are things like the received signal still has to be much, much, much stronger than the echo. Um, so you can get a near-perfect cancellation, but in a high-density environment where there's inherent noise in the air anyway, um, it probably still wouldn't work for a full duplex um, situation. So in enterprise um, and schools in most of the situations that we're working in, um, this received signal would still have to be very, very strong, so um, very close to the access point and without a lot of additional interference. Another um, significant challenge to overcome is this idea of transmitting and receiving on a single antenna, so full duplex on a single antenna. The problem with this is that uh, the Lawrence reciprocity uh, principle says that any signal in a network is not gonna, cannot be distinguished from other signals in a network on a physical scale. Um, unless you send it through a filter, right? So radio frequency waves are kind of look like a slinky. So if you hold them up and you stretch it out like this, it looks like a sinus wave. But if you turn it around the other way, it kind of spirals. But you can get it to spiral in a, in a different direction. So if you have a transmitted signal that's spiraling this direction and you send it through like a ferrite material, you can get it to spiral the other direction and be able to distinguish them physically in space. Ferrite materials don't fit on CMOS chips. So again, it goes back to that real uh, size problem. Um, so uh, at Columbia University, again, they're working on how to mimic the, the function of that ferrite material using transistors to get, get it to uh, the radio wave to spin in the opposite direction so that they can uh, only use one antenna for transmit and receive in a full du duplex system. MIMO also adds to the complexity of this. So every uh, experiment that's been done so far has been done in SISO. When you add other antennas into the mix, now you're looking at uh, an exponentially large number of calculations that need to be done because it's not just one transmitting antenna. Now you've got potentially four transmitting antennas and they all have uh, different signals uh, that need to be canceled and conditioned for. So the conditioning that I talked about before where uh, the, the filters are kind of breaking up the frequency into smaller pieces and then um, calculating them through an algorithm in order to get kind of that perfect cancellation signal is not an automated process. This is something that's going to have to be um, really thought through in terms of the environment. So uh, environments are ever changing, RF environments are ever changing, and it would need to be a really automated process like uh, in <laughs> milliseconds that it would need to change the way that it's, uh, it's, it's conditioning that transmitted uh, signal in order to be able to get that perfect cancellation. All right, so what should we, what should we expect um, from full duplex Wi-Fi? Um, <laughs> uh, I, <laughs> I didn't tell him I was going to do this, um, but I figured I'd blame it on him anyway. He didn't really say this, to be fair. Uh, I might be saying it. <laughs> uh, so when I, I first started, uh, so I actually decided to do this particular talk last year at Wi-Fi Trek, and I was like, I'm going to do it, I'm going to learn about it, uh, and I'm going to come here, I'm going to talk about it. And at the time... Uh, full duplex Wi-Fi was in a working group at the IEEE for 802.11bf, and I was like, sweet, best friends. Um, it's going to be great. And then a few months later, uh, it got rolled up into the EHT working group, so 802.11be. Um, and as of July, and I was like, okay, we're still in the mix. It's all good. It's been rolled up. It, we're we're going to move forward with this. In July, at the plenary for that working group, it was completely eliminated from the agenda. <laughs> um, so probably full duplex Wi-Fi is a little dead. Uh, it could have a resurrection. Um, I would love to see it have a resurrection. It obviously has been prove, proven in a lab to be completely possible. Um, it's just a matter of making it uh, feasible in, in enterprise and, and home WLANs. Um, but kind of as, as the title says here, like, 
oh, the possibilities, right? Can you imagine if we were, it, it would entirely change the way that we think about Wi-Fi if we were able to transmit and receive at the same exact time. Um, all the overhead that Keith was talking about earlier could potentially be gone. And we're no longer talking about um, a contention medium. So it'd be very, very interesting. So thank you so much. Um, I'm happy to field questions. I may or may not be able to answer them. Um, and if you want to um, check out some resources on it, um, this will take you there. And uh, yeah, thanks, guys. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jesse. So let's jump into Q&A here. Uh, Let's see, comment, then a question. Full duplex, duplex Wi-Fi is called LTEU or LLAA. Why moving all the disadvantages of Wi-Fi to full duplex? Agree or disagree? I'm not sure I understand that question. I'm not sure I do either. Maybe <laughs> you can rephrase it. Go ahead and just throw it back in there and just rephrase it. I guess you can just read the other one. Yeah, um, it says, Jesse, hey, Ryan. Um, do you know if anyone has looked at super regenerative regenerative receiver tech to help solve the signal echo problem. Nope. <laughs> Do you, Ryan, know the answer to that? Any other questions? Questions, comments? All right, very yep. good. Cool. Thank you, Jesse. <laughs>